Welcome to Two Left Feet. Welcome to Two Left Feet. Yes. Expert dancers, passionate lefties. Pow pow! You hit my microphone, oh, shit, so that's going to come out. So, today, yeah, we will be talking about versatility. The watchword of every performance artist, Ever. dancer, uh, of the freelancer, neoliberal age. Yay! So what do we talk about when we're talking about versatility? What comes into your mind when you talk about this? I think of being told that I had to be versatile when I was studying dance. And that kind of being like the word in the final year. (laughs) And also like the attitude. (laughs) Because it was like, you have to uh, sort of be at the beck and call of artists, choreographers, and that is like, an artist can be anything, a choreographer can want you to do anything, they can want you to like take your clothes off and then like cry and then do a pirouette and then um, um, climb a rope and then Mm. do like quite a sort of like visceral improvised dance. So you have to be ready to, at the drop of a hat, to do pretty much any thing that a human, a human being has ever done. Yeah, pretty For representation much. purposes. Yeah, pretty much. You, you need to be ready to perform any action in and, any way. And you have to be able to show that really quickly. <laughs> <laughs> like in an audition or something. I remember being told in an audition, uh, we, we did a, a phrase that we'd learned in three minutes. Uh, so everyone had a, ter- a turn. You all get, to, well, it was like 50 of us going at once. Oh, my Lord. Um, in a room of like 150. So... <laughs> all with the numbers on, you all get a chance to do this short phrase. Mm-hmm. And then at the end of that short phrase, you improvise a little bit. And then I had kind of thought we were doing a repeat of the phrase, so I didn't really start improvising until halfway through the 30 seconds of improv. 15 seconds improv? Yeah. Um, so like an improv so, add-on to the phrase? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Come out of the phrase improvising <laughs> um, in your way. Show your style. <laughs> People started going like triple pirouettes they started doing splits like <laughs> ramming their pelvises into the floor uh, uh, breaking themselves and I kind of like caught up oh shit I'm not supposed to be doing the phrase now I'm supposed to be um, throwing myself doing my thing and I did a little bit of dancing and then there was this the mechanism of being told you weren't going to be recalled was everyone lie down on the floor with your eyes closed and we're going to come around and we're going to tap you if you get tapped then that's just our gentle way of saying you're not coming back for the next round. <laughs> uh, and I got tapped and I went over to see whoever it was about what was wrong. And they'd said... What's wrong with me? Yeah. <laughs> well, I didn't know they, they But they said I, w- they was, I wasn't explosive enough for outdoor work. How interesting. Yeah. So for outdoor <laughs> dances, you need to be explosive. Uh, no one told me to be explosive, by the no, way. No, no. They said just improvise, but... But it's also like versatility totally relates to this like unexplained. We're not going to tell you what the criteria is. We just need you to sort of telepathically guess what we want to see. Mm-hmm. And so also the only way to possibly um, be in luck with doing or showing what someone wants to see <laughs> is by doing 10 things. <laughs> so you kind of get told that, I think, when you're like going to an audition and you yeah. get advice to, you know, from whoever. Well, a well anyway, this is not about additions, but like it, it it's 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 get like squeeze it in. I mean, yeah. you talked about it a little bit the other day about like um, your the first piece you made upon graduating, oh, yeah. feeling like it was this show which you know was like one piece with one theme with was you felt like that was kind of a bit of a showcase maybe or the yeah show. well I suppose in in many ways it was my one avenue into the professional dance world at the time yeah. I didn't know any choreographers so essentially it was the thing that people would see in order to make their minds up about whether I would get jobs have a career so it was yeah put in everything I can do so what does versatility make you think of in relation to, like, capitalism? Uh, it makes me think of labour value. What do you mean by that? Uh, I don't really know, but I think I've heard it in Marxist books. 
<laughs> or on the people's Marxist YouTube channels. Yeah, don't pretend you're reading Marx. <laughs> yeah, I'm not reading Marx. But we've we seen have, how big it is. We do have a um, his book. We do have a graphic. Oh yeah, look. A graphic illustrated. Just here. Not, not that we're like thick dancers or anything. Not that we're trying to promote the image of dancers as infants who can't read. But, but what if but, we? What if we can't read? And what if we are yeah. thick? Yeah. We can still be Marxists. And we should be allowed to. That's what the great folks at the Graphic Guide Company have <laughs> given us the ability to to do. But anyway, what I mean you is the the value that your labour. Ha, uh, has attached to it like mm. I suppose this is kind of what I understand of it is like um, yeah your work has a value and that is in capitalism that is to be exploited by the industry in the dance world in learning to juggle in learning to break dance as well as do ballet you're kind of amping up the amount of labor uh, the amount of value that your labor has mm -hmm. okay so when i say labor value i think uh, what i was actually referring to was um, a worker's labor power um, the value that a worker's labor power can add to an object in marxist theory which i've been watching videos about there's a lot of analogies and explanations which use factories, workers and business owners, um, otherwise known as capitalists. Um, so for a basic formulation, um, let's use that kind of model. Let's say that a business owner owns a t-shirt business. They, they have some money and they, they need to buy some cotton. They also need a factory to make the t-shirts, turn the cotton into t-shirts. Uh, but they'll also need workers uh, who can run the factory, uh, essentially turning the cotton into t-shirts. Here's where the labour power comes in. The workers' labour power has the unique ability to add value to the cotton via its transformation into a t-shirt. The labour power is what the worker hires out to the businessman for an agreed fee. So let's just take this to the dance world. Uh, let's imagine a choreographer has an idea for a piece. Uh, they also have funding from the Arts Council. In order for this idea to become a piece on stage, the choreographer needs to hire a ballet dancer. Someone who has the specific kind of labour power that this choreographer imagines that they require. Whilst a hip-hop dancer, a ballet dancer and a contemporary dancer all possess differing qualities, they all possess labour power and this labour power will be sought out to be utilised by whichever employees imagine that they require each different quality. As you may already be able to see, this is an area that is ripe for misunderstanding, debate and subjectivity. How exciting, how terrifying. And it's this like sort of opaqueness as well, like people not necessarily disclosing what they want to see from a group of auditionees or people teaching, um, suggesting that you need to learn every school rather than like specialise in something you're really good at and then, you know, sell that one thing. Hmm. It's like, you need to be able to do absolutely everything because um, <laughs> work is too sparse so the competition is too is really mm -hmm. high so you have to be able to like beat everyone. Not just who is in your specialism, but like <laughs> everyone around you. And also in terms of what, like, if this is true, I think, in lots of industries, like everything we talk about on this show is like, you know, can be applied to all sorts of different workplaces, but yeah. we work in dance, so that's what we're thinking around, I suppose. But like, there's so much in this um, creative, we can do another show about what creative means, in this creative industry, what is expected of you becomes very personal as well. Like, there's a lot of emotional oh labor yeah. that's expected of you. There's a lot of like, you're expected maybe to, um, put your personal stories, your personal history, your 
mm-hmm. um, traumas, your... And that always seems like this kind of thing of like, we want to move away from the idea of the single author of a work. We want to include the voices of the performers and then like the credit is like choreographed by so-and-so along with dancers and, and such and such. So it's kind of like dissolving the authorship between uh, the company mm. or the the group of freelancers and the initiator. Um, but it just kind of ends up being this like exploit your <laughs> experiences for my commercial gain. Like mine them, like dig like them di- up. Dig deeper than you ever might choose to mm. in this unsafe environment for doing so this is not a therapeutic space but no. can you please talk about your dead mum yeah and express that through spinning yeah can you be really like openly expressive with your body <laughs> like how vulnerable can you like yeah. you can't ask anyone to be more vulnerable than that i think like to like dance yeah um from a life experience and it happens a lot emotional labor is the process of a worker managing their emotions in order to meet the requirements of a job. It's the extra, often unpaid work they're expected to do that isn't necessarily in their job description. Often emotional labour requires someone to suppress their feelings. For example, a waiter will be expected to be happy all the time or appear friendly uh, to all customers even if they're having a really bad day. In the dance industry the emotional labour can manifest in this way so someone might be expected to do a performance, do a lively performance uh, even when they're feeling a bit depressed or sad or miserable. They still need to pull it out of the bag. A dancer might also, however, need to do a very different kind of emotional labour, which is not suppressing and bottling the emotions, but actually bringing them to the surface. So they might be expected to actively open up about personal experiences, or talk about how they feel, or they might be asked to make artistic content from stories from their personal lives, or they might be asked to dance how they're feeling to express themselves. And this ability to conjure emotions as and when they're needed is part of a dancer's labour power alongside their actual dancing abilities. There can be many positive outcomes to having a very uh, emotionally vibrant workplace. So it can be a therapeutic place, um, it can be quite rewarding, especially if you're doing it with people who you're happy and comfortable doing that with. However, if a dancer's emotional labour isn't recognised for what it is, work and it's not uh, sufficiently paid for or the means of extracting these emotions is not careful uh, or potentially it's harmful then it can be uh, problematic and there can be very complicated and negative outcomes and personal boundaries can be crossed intimate experiences can become overexposed and it can become hard to distinguish between personal and professional relationships or spaces. And for these things to become part of your labour value, it, it's, it's really, it's a problem, isn't it? Because it, in capitalism, everything you have is potentially a money-making um, tool or another aspect that you can wring out some, uh, some financial gain from. Your reflections on a lonely period of your life um, become uh, like your skills that can go into like a strengths and weaknesses, opportunities and threats analysis and yeah. Um, yeah. I think also like Don't we are me. working in the arts and I think it would be, you know, I think we understand and acknowledge that like the arts or artistic expression is like a really inherent part of making art. So like, it's not like we expect art is not going to be personal oh, yeah. and not going to be like to do with autobiography or about life or reflecting on your personal experience of things. But when you're talking about like an employment situation, mm. which is I think what we're talking about, yeah. right? like being a performer at the behest of a choreographer, which 
you know, is 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 just too often the case. But yeah, versatility. What were you? How are you going to bring it back? I was going to bring it back. Well, I guess what I was going to try and. Well, all the only thing in my mind was to bring it back. Actually, okay. just that we had had wandered, and I wanted to bring it back. Uh, and looking that we have about four minutes left. Um. Uh, well, hang on, you. <laughs> Uh, so uh, for me there's something about the labour value again in the versatility <laughs> thing there I don't know if this is a this is right but anyway surplus labour value imagine that imagine you have worked more than you can actually uh, be employed for uh, so you can't actually reap any financial gain from this extra work you've done. Um, I think that's inherent to a lot of dance situations. People are kind of training all the time to maintain a readiness to go mm. out and work. So... And there aren't any jobs. There, aren't, there isn't there enough isn't, work. There isn't enough work. So I've been saying surplus labour value quite a lot in this video. Um, the, the terms that are actually in Marxist theory that are not the kind of... The, the combination that I've just made up um, are labour power, which I explained earlier, and surplus value. To explain surplus value, in capitalism, the business owner cannot survive by paying the worker a wage that is equal to the value of the labour that they perform. It's just uh, that equation doesn't work for the, for the business owner. They need to make more than they pay out. And this is for reasons of uh, kind of growth or competitiveness. They need to stay afloat in, in a kind of uh, a sea of other business people. A worker will charge an amount of money for their labour that allows them to live a life in which they can survive. Uh, and more importantly, they can come back day after day to reproduce their labour again and again. The business owner will not pay the worker any more than the absolute minimum that they can get away with because, as I said before, in capitalism they need to remain competitive and to grow. Um, there's no reason for them to pay any more than the bare minimum and there's plenty of reasons for them to pay as little as possible. Let's say that a worker and a t-shirt business owner, back to the t-shirt, agree that the worker will be paid £20 for a day's work. Let's say that the worker can make one t-shirt in one hour. Let's say that the business owner will sell each t-shirt for £5. Let's say that the working day is eight hours long. So the worker, in theory, can make £40 worth of t-shirts. The worker then makes enough t-shirts to equal their £20 wage in four hours. That's half a working day. But the worker has to work the full eight-hour day. Because that's just how, uh, how jobs and societies work, isn't it? There's an eight-hour day and you have to be there for the whole thing. So the worker goes on making t-shirts for another four hours, generating another £20 worth of t-shirts. This is spent labour on the part of the worker for which they do not see the cash. This is what is called surplus value. It's also called profit. The value produced by the worker after they have produced the value of their wages. This is interesting when we turn it to dance. Uh, in some more business-like situations in dance there is very much a profit motive. Uh, in others, such as in publicly funded artistic projects, uh, possibly funded by Arts Council, the profit motive isn't quite so present. Let's say a choreographer and a dancer agree that the dancer will be paid £100 per day. Let's say that a dancer makes up a three-minute dance phrase on one of the days. Let's say that the choreographer and the theatre have agreed to charge £16 a ticket and expect to sell 100 tickets for a total of £1,600. 
this figure will be split 70-30 in favour of the choreographer and they might get two nights, but only if the first night sells out. This is quite a complex comparison really, it's not so easy to compare to the t-shirt factory. But anyway, in this case of feeling the need to be more versatile, let's say that the dancer works for eight hours a day, but then thinks that they should go to an extra class after work in another dance style to increase their chances of employability after this job finishes. So, in total they're working 10 hours a day. Eight for the choreographer they're currently working for, and two for the as yet undetermined future choreographer, who doesn't pay them any wage at all for this, for this extra time in the day, and doesn't even pick up the, the price of the bus ticket to the class. Maybe, though, on top of all this, this is because it is actually the dancer who is their own employer at that moment. This is just one area of their self-employed work. And this comes under their own business expenses as continued professional development in order that they can remain competitive, just like the t-shirt uh, business owner, and, and they need to remain competitive because uh, it's, it's very competitive out there, haven't you, haven't you heard about that? It's, it's dog eat dog, and you are the runt, so you need to train yourself up to be stronger so you can eat the other dogs. Yeah, I'm not sure if that's what surplus labour value refers to. <laughs> yeah, can we get to, can we just get oh, to the a... glossary of terms? Surplus value? Oh, sugar. We're going to be coming back to this yeah. book. Oh, the value of a product for which the work is not paid, hence the profit. Ah, okay. <laughs> okay, that is different. It's profit. We made an interesting But that's anyway. surplus value, that might not be surplus. Yeah. What did you say? Labour value. Labour value. This is a little learning process for us, and we're really happy that you're joining us on this journey. W witnessing us. We're really grateful. We hope um, also all these questions. Stuff. Oh, sorry. It's alright, I've got my own microphone. <laughs> Me too. All these questions that we I don't know the answers to will we will consult experts. There will be experts on board at some stage. We'll be hosting interviews with experts and we'll find out what what what, what surplus labour value actually is. Once and for all. And no one can stop us. <laughs> Yeah. Oh, you like ASMR? Yeah. No, I don't get it. Okay. I wish I did. I get it. <sighs> yeah. Sensation. Versatility. I think, you know, we've just touched tip of the iceberg and I'm excited to talk about it more. Me too. I'm excited to get more versatile. I'm excited to train in salsa tango and also fusion, uh, br uh, fusion bro dancing. Thanks for watching. Thanks for watching. See this you later. Bye.